Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Uh, time for us to take you through the pages of a national dailies. We call it Off the Press. And as usual, we have a legal practitioner, Tunde uh, Kolawale, joining the conversation. Good morning. It's good to have you join us. Good morning, my sister. That was the night. Very well. Thank you. And uh, Happy New Year. Same to you. It's all right then. Uh, let's take a look at the leadership newspaper this morning. As always, we will be looking at the big stories on the leadership newspaper. I start off with the uh, bold caption Ahead of election year, states prioritize capital projects in 2022 budget. And that's a bold caption. Experts foresee boom in economic activities, won against white elephant projects, and hinge successful implementation on stable federal allocations and political will. Uh, that's quite interesting. Away from that, Song Wo Lu pleads in standover uh, Magodo Estate siege. Uzadima fails to name sponsors of violence in Imo. And you also have gunmen killed 24 in fresh Kaduna attack. 44 Nigerian journalists killed in 2021, says NUJ. And federal government gets U.S. not to fight bandits with super, uh, super Tucano jets. Now, this is some of the headlines on the leadership newspaper. All right, to the Guardian uh, newspapers. Big one there says, barely one year to go, Buhari appoints economic advisor. Um, Zaka says, appointment is vote of no confidence on NEC. Excuse me, and also... Salami's economic thoughts are um, at variance with President's philosophy, says Adonri. France alerts the world of new COVID-19 variant, IHU. Still on The Guardian this morning, Olubadon, uh, in council, decides on secession plan today. Undume six prosecution of terrorists and sponsors. Gunmen killed nine and injure five in Kaduna. And in the southeast, Uzodima backtracks on naming sponsors of terrorism. Those are the big stories on the Guardian newspapers. Away from the Guardian newspaper, let's check out the Daily Independent. And the banner caption says, Federal government's auto gas policy hits rocks, may threaten deregulation. Major shakeup in Nigerian Air Force. Wike accuses Ogonis of destroying themselves and blaming others. Buhari appoints Doni Salami as chief economic advisor. Why we are yet to declare bandit as terrorists? That's what the federal government is going to say. I mean, I'm sure that we had this argument some other time where, you know, someone, uh, those guests who said, um, you know, the federal government had declared. We know that the court, the court had actually said that the federal government can go ahead, you know, to declare. But this will continue to be a conversation up until we get to that point. Anyone expecting anything positive from Buhari this year is wasting, is wasting his time. This is what Adeba and Joyce quoted to say. And uh, just before we move away, oil price hits $80 per barrel as Nigeria's output surged to 1.7 million barrels. Now, this is actually, you know, the, the highest, you know, since November. Somewhere Lu intervenes in Magodo land tussle. Others stand down. I mean, the Osongwo Lu's case uh, would constantly dominate, and we had that conversation uh, just before this time. I have to part to be Tambowa's running mate in 2023. Mimiko is quoted, and that's the much uh, we have here on the Daily Independent newspaper. All right, now to the Punch newspapers. Amcon lists 7,912 names owing 4.4 trillion naira as deadline expires today. National Assembly has directed we publish debtors' lists, says the corporation. This is a final warning. Don't be taken by surprise, Amcon tells debtors. And also, automatically in 30 years' time, youths will carry government's mounting debt board, uh, burden. And that's um, from the president of uh, uh, Carrington Fellowship. Muslim Muslim ticket, unacceptable, says uh, Khan. Um, Oaneza to lobby north and southwest for all Igbo presidential race. Oshimba Joe's presidential campaign billboard surfaces in Abuja. And um, also Magodo protests, Songo Lu, police team leader, a police team leader rather, exchange words, governor plans meeting. Four inmates killed, water injured in Oshun, attempted jailbreak. And um, 
Dana plane and a speeding car in near collision in Lagos Airport taxiway. Uh, I think these are the stories that we can share. Okay, there's a couple of others on the point this morning on the presidency. Tinubu Group um, boasts of national spread, says ex-governor ahead of others. All right, um, Mr. Kolawale, good morning and thanks for joining us once again. Yeah, good morning once again. All right, I think we can start from, you know, the one that has... Um, you know, being the most controversial in the last 24 hours, and that's it. the Lagos State Governor uh, and his uh, brief confrontation with uh, the CSP at the Magodo Estate. And, of course, uh, the controversy over what's going on over there, Mr. Kolawali. Uh, honestly speaking, what is happening in Magodo or to the Magodo uh, Resident Association or the people who have property there, it's a very, very big tragedy which in itself is caused by our allies. Many people will not know that the Magodo issue has been going on for the past 35 or 36 years. It started during the military era when the, mili when the military administration in Lagos State took over the land in Magodo and said it was going to be used for, the public, uh, for public purpose. But lo and behold, after that track of land was seized, our allies in Lagos State started sharing the land among themselves. And then they converted it to residential uh, estate. The civil servants in particular, when the lands were demarcated, some of them would take about 10 parcels, develop two, and sell the remaining eight make a huge profit from the land they had to told the owners was going to be used for public purpose. And you know under the Nigerian law, under the Nigerian constitution, a governor using the land use act as an instrument can confiscate or take any land from the owners, compensate them, and then uh, decide to use it for public purpose. That was the pretext under which the Magodo land was taken by the government. And then when the people who own the land found that the land is not being used for public purpose, they went to court. And the matter traveled as far as the Supreme Court. And the people won at the Supreme Court. Because the land is already occupied, the Supreme Court ordered the legal state government to at least find not less than 594 parcels of land for the indigenous people of Magodo. So that their children and great grandchildren can also have a place to build their future home and a land to call their own. But unfortunately, the local state government has not been able to abide by this decision of the Supreme Court. I think what they simply done is to go to Ikorudu and find land and give some parcels um, to some of the people in there. And then to... So, um, what's in the situation? Yes, please. Okay, so um, let's also look at, um, you know, the, the real, the crux of the matter. It was a face-off between the governor of... The uh, clash State between the, their, you know, the commissioner of police or the new idea of police. The, the representative. So a lot of people were saying that the governor, uh, you know, it was a total disrespect. So at this point, what, what would have been, I mean, what do you think the governor should have done? Do you think that, um, you know, the governor should probably have, uh, you know, put out that call before getting there? Or do you think it would have been right for the police officer to just obey the governor and move away? I mean, this, uh, these are some of the well, issues... Under our law, the police, no matter how big they might be, they are still under, technically speaking, under the jurisdiction or subject to the decisions and directives and no doubt of the governor. And if the commissioner of police or the new AIG of police, as he claimed in one of the, the things he said to the newspaper, that he is empowered by law, he has the power to go to anywhere he deems fit in Lagos or notice without telling them, without informing them, and take whatever decisions or actions he decides to take. 
which I don't think is correct. It is the governor that you could say has that kind of a power. If the governor hadn't given a notice, that would uh, detract from what he has gone to do. But it doesn't mean that the governor could not decide to meet the police and the resident association without giving them uh, any long notice. It could be because of the emergency situation on ground in Magoto that the governor went there to douse the tension. You remember then the, during the NSAS process, he also went to Lekki to see whether he could quench the fire that was smoldering in there. The truth of the matter is that uh, what is happening in Magoto is executive recklessness. Executive recklessness. If our allies hadn't confiscated the land that didn't belong to them and that they never, they did not use, they didn't want to use for public purpose, there wouldn't have been crisis in Magodo today. If the Commissioner of Police in Lagos State, Aiji Odumosu, had shown respect for the people of Magodo, what we have on ground today in Magodo wouldn't be there. So we himself wouldn't have to go there to go and start confronting the, the, the police. In an ideal manner, whatever orders and directives that some will look give to the police who are on guard in Magodo, the police are supposed to obey him. Recollect that under Fashola, when an army colonel was driving on the DRT lane and Fashola was passing by, Fashola immediately stopped his vehicle, accosted the army colonel, and they uh, tried to arrest and reprimand them. The army colonel didn't confront uh, Fashola. Rather, he was giving a salute and uh, apologizing profusely. And uh, because of his apology, Fashola pardoned him. He said he wouldn't be taking more actions against him. That is the way it should be. Also, remember not too long ago, a citizen slapped the French president, Emmanuel Macron, when he was on the campaign trail. Nobody shot at that uh, uh, French citizen. Macron did not even ask his uh, security detail to beat him. The man was never of handled. He was politely arrested and prosecuted in court. But because an AIG of police went to Magoto and uh, he wasn't, his name wasn't on the list of people they were expecting in Magoto at that period in time. Rather than the so-called AIG of police calling his host, the person he was going to meet, I have these issues at the security gate. Can you please call the security to let me in that I'm your guest? He became very arrogant and decided to bulldoze his way through and arrest uh, the security men who were merely carrying out the instructions that were given to them. Is that the way to behave? It is just a continuation of the impunity a continuation of uh, this high handedness, a continuation of uh, 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 a kind of uh, what would I uh, describe as uh, rulership instead of leadership, a continuation of arrogance on the part of people whom you find in most of the security agencies that we have in this country today, right, whether it's it be the whether it be the police, whether it be the army and all that. And we have to stop that executive recklessness. So for me, the world is on the right path. And it's on a very firm ground to have gone to Magodo, not only to pacify the residents of that place, but to also give an order to the police to withdraw the Magodo proper, the Magodo estate is a private estate. The police don't have the power, they don't have the right to go in there without an order from a court of competent jurisdiction. The road leading to that estate may be a public estate, that all individuals, all Nigerians, all Nigerians can traverse. But if you're going to be entering that private estate and carrying out any police actions in there, you need a order to a court of competent jurisdiction to be able to do that. So let's call a state a state. There has been executive recklessness, irresponsibility on the part of the security people from right. the past 35 years. How we are going to resolve this conundrum is what I don't know. Uh, Mr. But Kola the Ole, of the matter is in, in the interest of in time, the in the interest of time, let's also move um, on All so right. we can speak on other, on other um, um, stories this morning in the papers. Okay. Uh, let's
let's look at the leadership newspaper now. And again, uh, ahead of elections in 2023, state prioritized capital projects in their 2022 budget. But most interesting is the fact that um, there will be, this project would be successfully completed uh, and there would be stabilization, uh, which will be dependent on federal allocation. Uh, does that call for a lot of concern at a time where it feels like our finances are quite shaky? Should states, you know, constantly be dependent on federal allocation for the implementation of the budget? Well, that is uh, the tragedy of the Nigerian nation. All efforts that we have made as our people to make sure that um, internally generated revenue, whether at the local government level, whether at the state level, whether at the state, I mean at the federal level, they have never worked. We have always depended on oil from the Niger Delta to finance whatever programs, activities and projects that we had them to say or that we had wanted to uh, to consult in Nigeria, which ordinarily should not be. Where we are not depending on the rent coming from oil. We have been borrowing in a massive manner for the past six or seven years to finance most of these projects. The tragedy of the whole thing, like I've always said, is that uh, most of these projects were, at the end of the day, inflated. Another tragedy is that most of these projects are never geared towards elevating the suffering of the ordinary people of Nigeria or giving them infrastructure that will give them value and service. They are mostly signature projects. Go and check. They want to build a flyover, which nobody, which is very difficult for you to do the quantity survey and know how much it's going to cost. That is where they make, they get huge cut back. They want to renovate stadium. They also want to build a ring road of maybe about 35 kilometers for billions of naira and all that. When you find the federal government saying this kind of a thing, things that they have not been able to do for the past six or seven years or thereabout, how would they not be able to achieve it when we have entered an election year? The history of our country has shown that any time we enter an election year, governance is always in abeyance. The people, the politicians, never pay attention again to, to, to governance. All that they are interested in how they will win the next election, how they will raise the funds through corruption to finance the next election. So honestly speaking, I think uh, this statement coming from government is just a way to kind of uh, give the Nigerian people a kind of false hope that they will still be committed to governance before so the next government so. comes into power. It has never happened in the history of our country. I'm not too sure. All right. Uh, we seem happen. to have lost... Uh... Over the I mean, the lifetime okay, well, of the we'll present have back. administration. It has shown so much incompetence, corruption, recklessness, ineptitude, and the infinity. That's uh, nothing good. Just like uh, pa, uh, the Afghanistan leader has said, nothing good again should be expected from this government until they leave power in 2020. Well, thinking about what to expect from the government now, um, it was, of course, uh, news yesterday. It says on The Guardian this morning, barely uh, one year to go, Buhari appoints economic advisor uh, in the presence of Doin Salami. Uh, yeah. Mr. Kolawale, you know, is that something yeah. that maybe should give <laughs> hope uh, to Nigeria's economy? Honestly speaking, uh, that is a very strange appointment for me. Like I just told you now, we are in an election year. Nobody is going to listen to any economic advisor. And if we appoint an, uh, an economic advisor, what is going to be happen to the National Economic Council, headed by um, the Vice President? Do you know that the Constitution specifically gave the Vice President the responsibility, the powers, and the, where we are to manage the Nigerian economy. And then report to Mr. Mr. President and the National Economic Council. So what is going to happen to the constitutional responsibility that uh, the Vice President has with regards to the economy? 
What about the other finance minister and some of these other people in the economic council that we have in there? What is going to happen to them? Is this salami going to start to pretend them over the activity without uh, brushing, without clashing, without uh, a misgiving? The answer is no. I have also tried to read the profile of Mr. Salami and his economic thought, his own blueprint as regards how material economy should be managed, appears to be in variance with what the present, the present government has as his own economic blueprint. So if you appoint a Marxist to come and manage a capitalist economy, I will do achieve results. I will they be able to work together conveniently. Or if you appoint somebody who is a welfareist to come and manage a capitalist economy, how will his welfareist program dovetail or go into your own economic program as a government? It doesn't work that way. It would appear to me that this appointment is a fire brigade approach to douse whatever crisis that they might have in, hand, in their hands. It could also be that the president has made this appointment in view of what most Nigerians have been saying, that what legacy will President Muhammadu Buhari be leaving behind when he leaves in 2023, which is a tattered nature in which the economy has found itself under him, with the high level of insecurity, high level of unemployment, comatose in socialization. And honestly, for me, whether you are appoint 10 or 20 salamis to manage this economy for 2023, it's like putting a cart before the horse. And when you put a cart before the horse, you achieve zero results. Okay, um, let's also look at the leadership. Uh, this might just sound like, you know, some good news especially as we fight against, uh, you know, insurgency. Uh, federal government gets the United States nod to fight bandits with super Tocano jets. Let's quickly share your thoughts on that. And just uh, recently we hear that uh, 40, 24 persons have been killed in Kaduna State. It is ridiculous. Uh, for me, it is not a scary name. How will we as a nation buy an equipment and it is a seller that will be dictated to you how the equipment is used at the end of the day. What this tells us is that when Nigeria was negotiating for the purchase of that Tucano aircraft, they didn't do proper negotiation. Such that there were eBay clauses in there. There were clauses to tie the hands of the federal government or the Nigerian nation to do whatever they want to do with that attack uh, uh, plane. I don't see it. I am not too sure any nation will enter into that kind of an agreement besides Nigeria. That you will buy a war equipment and the person that sells the equipment to you will not be the one calling the shots as regards how you use it or, and how you don't use it. The main reason why in the first instance Nigeria went to buy the Tucano attack uh, plane was to be able to find all manners of criminality, insurgency and banditry in the country. But now we are helpless. Our hands are tied. It is the Americans who sold the, the plane to us that now call the shots. It is well, a very well, I, I think it's mostly and because... a very embarrassing one. I, 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 I may be wrong, but I think it's mostly because, you know, before you get approved how to buy certain types of weapons, you know, there, there needs to be clarity that it will be used um, against insurgency and, you know, insurgency alone. Uh, because of the human rights concerns and civilian casualties that some of these weapons, you know, could cause. I think that's mostly where the approval is coming from. And once again, I might be wrong. Um, but no, it's, I don't it's not necessarily, so. you know, the seller giving you a go-ahead, you know, before you can My brother, it. I don't think so. If it was going to be because of human rights violation, are we saying that bandits that have been declared as terrorists it belongs to the human rights community. Are you kind of equating them with the like of Shogores, with the like of uh, uh, Adenia Jews, or some of these uh, young boys and girls who organize the MSAS uprising? 
The answer is no. If America was selling this kind of aeroplane to you, and they were putting this kind of conditionalities into it, you could as well go to some other countries of the world. And by they are not the only one that sell attack helicopter, effective uh, uh, attack plane. France also sells a very effective uh, attack plane. Russia at all. The truth of the matter is that uh, America are really concerned about the so-called human rights that we all uh, uh, talk about all the time. In your paper today, it's reported in there that more than 44 journalists have been killed in the last one year in Nigeria. Go and investigate the circumstances in which those journalists were killed. Most of them were killed in the course of the performance of their duties. Why is America not raising news and cries about the death of those journalists? Nigeria has become a police state. The young people in the southeast are being shot at it indiscriminately. They are being attacked with uh, different uh, weapons. Why is nobody talking about that? That it is only we are talking about the use of the Tucano. Is it only Tucano plane that can be used to kill people? Is it only Tucano plane that is being, is being used to kill the, the use of the Nile, I mean, of the South South and the South East? Look, it, it all depends on negotiation. If we had negotiated very well, and uh, we are not uh, kind of uh, a slave or subordinate to the whims and caprices of the regime in uh, Washington. That kind of a clause shouldn't have been in the agreement when we were buying the attack or the Tucano uh, plane. It's not because of any human rights. They came into Nigeria here when one of their citizens was uh, abducted from the Nigerian Republic by bandits and brought to Nigeria. And then they were asking for ransom. They came with all that, all amateurs of uh, of uh, attack of uh, of weapons. They came with a ship. It was on the land. They came with a uh, sophisticated fire. I mean, uh, attack jet. They came with all manners of weapons to rescue that person. Why weren't they talking about human rights when they were invading our territory to rescue their own citizens? Okay. I don't, I don't subscribe to that argument. All right, Mr. Kolawole, um, sadly, that's all the time that we have uh, for uh, this uh, discussion this morning and, of course, our press review. Thank you very much for joining Thanks us. For and, of course, me. we always enjoy uh, listening to your perspectives on issues. We wish you a great day ahead. You are highly appreciated, too. Thank you. Absolutely. Stay with us. Um, we'll take a short break and of course when we come back we'll tell you uh, what happened on this day in history. Uh, we're going to be talking about a boxer, Sonny Liston, that comes up next. And of course right after that our first major conversation for today, moving to the southeast. <laughs>